Hey everybody, welcome back to ICA Online Service. We have a few quick announcements so that you can catch up with what's going on here at ICA. Prayer service is still on every Tuesday, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m., but it will be on Zoom, so make sure you follow ICASBY on Instagram so that you can know the meeting ID and join us to pray together. Hey parents, did you know that ICA Kids are online? If you follow the bit.ly link that's on your screen, you will get all the information that you need so that you and your child can have a great experience and encounter God together. Hey, did you know that online giving is happening? You can follow our QR code so that you can easily give to your church. Hey ICA, today is communion, so remember to prepare your drink already or your piece of cracker or bread, or in my case, macaroni. All right, the worship is about to start. Don't forget to follow us on social media everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube for all the latest and greatest. God bless you guys. Have a great service. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. Let's do it together this morning. Not God. 
help comes from the Lord. I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. Comes from you, Lord. I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. Oh, we declare, we declare of this, come on, say, I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord.
of the glory You are worthy of it all You are worthy of it all For from you are all things And to you are all things You deserve the glory
Holy Communion is how Christians remember and honor Jesus' self-sacrifice as He paid for our sin and purchased our forgiveness. It's how we show our gratitude for God's invitation to have a relationship with Him. It's how we acknowledge that Jesus is truly worthy of it all. If you've committed yourself to follow Jesus, we invite you to join us in Holy Communion. I'm gonna ask that you take a piece of bread and take it in your right hand. Our scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. I want you to take your drink in your right hand. And the scripture continues in 1 Corinthians 11. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, this morning we thank you for the sacrifice of your life and the purchase and the price and the cost and the extent to which you were willing to go in order to purchase our forgiveness and offer us an opportunity in, in relationship with you. Lord, this morning, we honor you. God, truly, as we just finished singing, you are worthy of it all. And we give ourselves to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We wanna welcome our English and Bahasa Indonesia speaking audiences today. If this is your first time to join ICA online, we are so glad that you're here. Selamat datang kepada semua teman-teman saudara saudari terkasih yang berbahasa Indonesia. Gereja ini ada untuk saudara. Setiap minggu, ibadah kami di YouTube mempunyai teks terjemahan dalam bahasa Indonesia. Saudara bisa menyalakan ini dengan menekan tombol CC di bagian bawah layar di YouTube, saudara. Pastikan saudara mengajak semua teman-teman dan keluarga tercinta yang berbahasa Indonesia untuk bergabung dengan kami. Kami berharap untuk bertemu saudara di ibadah ini. You know, today our goal is to answer a couple very important questions. Where is God in crisis and tragedy? How do I overcome disappointment with God? Today we pick up our storyline in the Bible immediately following Jesus' resurrection. A number of writers in the scripture recorded that Jesus' appearances at different times and in different places before his ascension. Today we're going to look at one of these eyewitness accounts of Jesus after the resurrection. Luke 24 records how Jesus appeared to two of his followers on Resurrection Sunday. We read in Luke 24, That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking in the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, 
you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. Cleopas was disappointed and disillusioned. He thought Jesus was the fulfillment of scriptural prophecy. He thought Jesus was God's promised Savior. Cleopas dedicated his life to following Jesus. And for what? Where was God when Jesus was arrested? Where was God when Jesus was tortured to death? You know, how could God allow this to happen to Jesus? You can hear the frustration in Cleopas's voice. You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that happen. Luke 24 continues, what things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and the other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. You know, that last sentence reveals the extent of their disappointment and disillusionment. Their world was turned upside down by crisis and tragedy. I'm sure Cleopas was asking the same questions that many are asking today. Where is God in crisis and tragedy? How do I deal with disillusionment and disappointment with God? This global pandemic, COVID-19, has turned many lives upside down. Not just here in Surabaya or Indonesia, but around the world. Our lifestyle has drastically changed. The things we counted on have been taken away. People are losing income, losing jobs, losing businesses, losing hope, and losing their lives. So where is God in this global crisis? It's an important question. There are actually two answers to this question. First, you'll find God in the hearts of his people. He's in the hearts of those who are caring for others and meeting people's needs. God is in the heart of generous people giving to ICA Missions COVID-19 fund, which is used to meet the needs of our church and people in our community. God is in the hearts of individuals who take the initiative to check on each other, to pray for each other, and to work to meet individual needs. God is in the hearts of Christian healthcare workers who are serving the needs of the sick and dying at the risk of their own lives. God is working through ICA small groups who are watching out for each other and collaborating to serve people's needs. God's in the heart of business people who are saying, hey, I can help with that, or I have access to this, how can I help? God is in the heart of people working with ICA social ministry to meet the needs of our community. We've already, this, this last week, we were able to serve 30 YDP families and over 300 Sambisari families by provided things like Sambaco and disinfectant and masks, medicine and vitamins. God is in the heart of people working with ICA missions to provide hospital equipment, ADP suits, and Sambaco for more than 600 families and other Yayasans in Surabaya and parts of East Java. God is in the heart of people who gave to ICA missions so that we could turn around and donate 400 Juta to help more than 1,800 GSGA pastors across Indonesia whose churches are closed and they have no income. ICA is not unique. God is in the hearts of his people in countless churches across Indonesia and around the world. God is in the hearts of his people to provide hope, to touch lives, and to meet the practical needs of their communities. Where is God during tragedy? You'll find him in the hearts of his people. And secondly, you will find God grieving during times of tragedy. Where was God when I lost my loved one, my husband, my son, my mother, my father? God was doing the same thing you were doing. He was grieving. The Bible tells us that God experiences emotion. 
God himself grieved the loss of his own son on the cross. Jesus wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. Jesus grieved over the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. This is an important point because it means that the God of the Bible stands beside us and feels our pain. We're not alone in pain and suffering. Well, why does God allow tragedy to begin with? Why did God allow COVID-19? Answering this question requires that we understand some simple facts. First, the world is not heaven. In heaven, God's will is done perfectly, completely, and continually. Human history and our own personal life experience is confirmation this is not heaven. And secondly, the world is broken. It's full of death, destruction, suffering, abuse, selfishness. This brokenness is why Jesus came to earth in the first place. God doesn't have his complete will here on earth. It's why Jesus taught us to pray when he said, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, he's saying, look guys, pray that God's will, which is done in heaven, will be done on earth. And thirdly, God gives people the freedom to choose. If you want heaven on earth, then God would have to take away people's freedom of choice. But that makes us robots. And one of the greatest gifts God has given us is the power to choose. We have the power to love God or turn our back on him. We have the power to love others or treat them with contempt. We have the power to do good or to do bad. Tragedy is the result of people turning their backs on God to do bad, to sin. Genesis chapter 3 explains how and why the world went wrong. This is the biblical explanation for the broken lives and families in the world that we see today. The suffering and tragedy we experience and we see is the result of human failure, not God's failure. It is the reason God sent his son to save the world. As these men walked and talked on the road to Emmaus, Jesus suddenly is walking with them. And Jesus asks what they're talking about. They don't realize it's Jesus talking to them. And they explained what happened in Jerusalem. And then they said, we had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. What they thought God was doing didn't happen. They were disappointed and disillusioned. So what does it mean to be disillusioned? Well, Disillusionment is a feeling of disappointment resulting from the discovery that something is not as good as you believed it to be. Disillusionment can affect our relationship with our spouse, our family, our friends, our coworkers. We can be disillusioned with God and his church. The process has three different steps, infatuation, disillusionment, and withdrawal. But it starts with infatuation, which is an intense but short-lived passion or admiration for someone or something. The disciples were infatuated with the miracle worker from Galilee. Jesus spoke with uncommon wisdom. He repeatedly stunned people by doing impossible miracles. Jesus' understanding of the scriptures was unrivaled in his day. The prophecies of scripture and his life kept pointing to him as the coming savior. The power structures of Jesus' day could never stand up to his authority. And God seemed to do everything he said. Wherever he went, he makes things right. He talked about God's coming kingdom. Everything was perfect. And they believed Jesus was the one to lead this new kingdom and restore Israel. Infatuation is that first time a man looks into the eyes of a woman and only sees perfection. Infatuation is when you have that great business idea that meets a demand in the marketplace. 
Infatuation is the excitement you have going to a new church that seems to be really going somewhere and doing something. Infatuation is when we love living for Jesus, for the peace and the prosperity and the blessing without spiritual growth. Then at some point, reality hits us square in the face. You wake up and you realize that your spouse in the morning has bad breath. You run into opposition. You count the cost. You realize the sacrifice required to achieve a dream. Infatuation meets disillusionment when we face a world that is turned upside down. Coming to understand the gap between our expectation and reality can be painful and lead us to that next step, which is disillusionment. Disillusionment is the painful gaining of reality. It is the result of falling, failing to accept the gap between our expectation and reality. Disillusionment comes when God doesn't answer our prayer how we want it. It's the first time a couple realizes that their spouse is flawed and that marriage is hard work and it requires us to forgive and to give up our own rights. Disillusionment is when the market collapses and it doesn't matter how hard you work or how good your business model is, it still fails. Disillusionment is when you realize that your church is made up of imperfect people and you see its flaws. Disillusionment is when you ask God for a baby and then miscarry. If we fail to resolve the gap between our expectation and reality, we go through the next and the final step, which is withdrawal. Withdrawal is when we are unable to deal with the reality we didn't expect and we quit. We say to God, that's it, I've had enough. I'm done with working hard without recognition. I'm done with people who fail. I'm done with people who betray. I'm done with ethical business practices only to get burned myself. I'm done with my disappoint, disappointed marriage. I'm done with the dream I never seem to achieve. I'm done trying to live according to God's word and still experience pain and suffering. Disillusionment with God is the result of our personal expectation and God's will not matching. We're unable to work through the painful gaining of reality and as a result, sometimes people walk away from God in resentment and bitterness. God didn't do what we expected. He didn't do what we wanted. But let's connect this disappointment to the story today. These men were struggling with disillusionment as they walked down the road. They were on the verge of withdrawal, and I'm sure they were thinking about giving up. They were looking for clarity in their confusing circumstances, and I don't think it's very different from many people today. So what stopped these two men from walking away from God? What saved them in their crisis of belief? Well, Jesus showed up. Jesus appeared in their confusion and brought clarity. We read in Matthew chapter 24, it says that, then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus brought clarity to their question, why did this tragedy happen? Jesus explained from the scriptures that God had a plan all along. Even though they experienced moments of ambiguity, confusion, pain, and grief, God was purposefully working his better plan. This is how a follower of Jesus can endure pain and suffering crisis and tragedy and still find hope. They hold fast to the idea that God is in control, that God knows what he is doing, that God is trustworthy, 
that God's plan for me is ultimately good. Romans chapter 8 brings perspective to all of our circumstances. It says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. God causes everything, even crisis and tragedy, to work for the good of those who love Him. God was doing this very thing through the tragedy of the cross. This tragedy was part of God's plan for the good of you and me and all of humanity. I have to tell you, I do believe that God is in control. In the midst of all these circumstances, God knows what He is doing. God is trustworthy. God's plan for me and you is good. And I have this deep-rooted conviction that God somehow is doing something good in spite of this global pandemic. Today, if you're struggling with disillusionment and you still love God, stand on the conviction of Scripture that God is working for your good in all circumstances. Ask Jesus to show up in your life and bring clarity like he did for these men on the road. Don't allow the painful gaining of reality to drive you away from God. That's the wrong response. If you love God, He will work all circumstances for your good. Jesus didn't give up on humanity when He was on the cross and things were hard. He worked through the painful reality of human sin. And as a result, we have access to forgiveness of sin and eternity with God in heaven. Matthew 24 continues, it says, By this time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he was going on, but they begged him, Stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? Jesus shows up in the middle of their crisis of belief, and he brings clarity and peace. Within an hour, these men were headed back to Jerusalem, even though it was the middle of the night. And they tell the rest of the disciples that Jesus was alive. They had seen him too. Maybe you've never made that decision to follow Jesus yourself. Some, but something inside of you is drawn to him. It's like Jesus' words simply burn in your soul. Perhaps you don't understand why. Perhaps you can't even articulate what's going on, but you know that Jesus is the truth. And you are looking for clarity, for purpose, and for the assurance of eternal life. And perhaps this morning you want to connect to Jesus like these men. Well, how do I do that? How do I connect to Jesus? First of all, believe in Jesus and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Ask God's forgiveness for your sins against God and your sins against others. Commit yourself to live for God by reading and following His Word. Find and become a part of a church where people genuinely love Jesus and try to live an authentic faith. Tell someone about your decision to connect to Jesus. In fact, contact ICA through our website Go to the online service page. Click the link that says, Yes, I believe. We would love to connect with you as you are making that decision to follow Him. Perhaps you're here today and you're in the middle of your own crisis. Perhaps it's a crisis dealing with your family or your job or your business or your schooling. Perhaps circumstances are outside of your control. 
You need Jesus to show up in your life. You need clarity in your crisis or even tragedy. You need God to work out His perfect plan when everything around you is out of control. I want you to know something. You can trust that God is in control, that God knows what He's doing, that God is trustworthy, and that God has a plan for you that is good. I want to pray for those of you who are struggling with your own crisis, suffering or tragedy, and seeking clarity and hope. You want God to show up in your circumstance? You want God to work for your good? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for the message of hope that your life and your example provides. Lord, I just pray for your people and for those that are on the outside looking at Christianity and they are looking at you for answers. Lord, I just pray that God, you would show up in the middle of their crisis, in the middle of their confusion, in the middle of their suffering or even tragedy, and you would bring clarity, that you would bring hope, and that you would bring salvation. God, I just thank you because you are a God who stands beside us. You don't separate yourself from our emotions. You don't separate yourself from our pain. Lord, you understand it fully because you went through it. Lord, thank you for the closeness and the association that you're willing to have with broken people like us. Lord, I pray that you would give hope to those that are looking for you, God. Hope for those that are making that choice to follow you for the first time. Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, people would have a sense of assurance that you are in control, that you know what you're doing, that you are trustworthy, and that your plan for us is good. Now, Lord, would you execute that plan to its fullest? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning before you go, we're just going to give you this final blessing. We call it the benediction. It's a passage of scripture that we're going to pray over you. And it's from Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. And it says this, And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. I pray this blessing over you your family, your business, your city, and your people, and your country. In Jesus' name, amen.